Next up, we have Sam Frost, and uh, he has a Master of Arts in Christian Studies and a Master of Arts in Religion from Whitfield Theological Seminary. He was a, pro a prominent leader in the hyper-preterist movement for several years until 2010 when he announced his rejection of that view. Now, uh, speaking of journeys, I mean, that it takes a lot of guts to do that. It's, uh, you know, just being looking at evidence, continue to just pursue truth, you can adjust yourself, and especially if you're a leader in a movement to do that um, is, I think, fascinating and also very encouraging in a lot of ways. Um, uh, you can read about it in his book, Why I Left Full Preterism, which we have uh, at the book table here live, uh, which I will be purchasing and reading. So he's also author of Daniel Unplugged, several other books besides that. Uh, you can find his blog at vigil.com blog. So let's everybody, uh, again, he's not talking about preterism. He's going to be talking about spiritual death in Genesis. And so let's give it up for Sam. All right. Well, thank you. So if I was going to speak on, um, on full preterism, it would be 70 AD, 70 AD, Josephus, 70 AD, 70 AD, Matthew 24, Josephus, 70 AD. And that would be hyper preterism. <laughs> Let's talk about 70 AD. Everything 70 AD. What about this verse? 70 AD. Um, so thank you, Chris, for inviting me here. I wanted to get into, if you don't run me out after what we hear today, uh, Genesis 2 and 3. That will be the main uh, text. But first, let's open, open with prayer. Father, we thank you. You give us understanding. You cause our eyes to see, both internally and externally. You cause the light to refract and bend in certain ways that we see things and understand them. You cause our understanding. You give us wisdom. You are wisdom. You are knowledge. You are truth. Your word is truth. Help us to understand together your truth by your spirit, for your glory, the glory of your kingdom, the glory of your name. We thank you for everything that you've given to us, our life, our breath, and our thoughts, and today this fellowship where we share our joy in you because of what you've done and are doing and will do for eternity. In your Son's name, Jesus Christ, we ask and pray and thank you for these things. Amen. So, what better way to spend a Saturday than with a bunch of people talking about the Word of God? Even though we differ, the Holy Spirit uses these things, I think, to encourage and edify us in a multiple of ways that we are often unaware of or are imperceptible. But he's edifying and strengthening us. We could be out doing the things of the wicked right now on a Saturday, but instead we're talking about the Bible, and we're talking about scriptures, and we're, we, we have joy about it. There's, there's enthusiasm about it. There's excitement. Even though there's differences and disagreements, that doesn't make any difference. The fact is, is that that's what we're doing in fellowship with God. We want to fellowship with one another because something, someone has brought us together and united us in the body of Christ that otherwise most of you I probably wouldn't hang out with at all because I just don't have anything in common with you. <laughs> Quite truthfully, I'm pretty much one of these loner guys. So, but when I do get to meet you and when I do begin to fellowship and we do begin to talk about Scripture and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and, and Jesus and salvation and all of it. And all of a sudden, there is a thing that begins to happen with me and Chris or whoever I'm talking to, and, and there it is. And that's the Lord. That's God. That's what he's brought us together. So I say all of that so that you'll be nice to me. Hopefully, you won't run me out after I get through this text. One of the things I was listening to uh, yesterday is how we approach text, and we have filters that Eli talked about. We have different ways of looking at text, coming at text. Of course, there's traditions, and you can wade through all of the postmodernist philosophy and linguistic philosophy and all of that kind of stuff to get into particular texts and read them in a way, and another person reads them, and then we come out with just two almost completely incompatible views. Or there's also uh, traditions 
that uh, we are a part of that help us read our text. And all of these things are necessary. They're all good. They're all included in what we want to read into the text. And then what we all want to say, I want to believe in what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? And in Genesis, we find that very thing going on there. And I think that it's by the Spirit that it's placed there. What did God say? I think that what happens in Genesis 2 and in 3 is exactly those kinds of things of figuring out what it is that he said, exactly what he said. For example, in Genesis chapter 2, he commands Adam, or an instruction, Jephah, he gives him an instruction, and he says, you can eat from all of the trees of the garden except this one. I don't want you to eat from this one. In the day you eat of it, you will die. Now, Adam is the only one on the spot here. There is no Eve. The Hebrew is singular. He's not giving this commandment to Eve. In fact, he never does give it to Eve. That's a significant thing. However, Eve comes into the picture, and in Genesis 1, 28, God says that you may eat, and for all of you, uh, for all of the trees of fruit or tree or fruit-bearing trees, you may eat from all of them. They will be for food to you. So Adam is restricted from a particular tree, but when Eve comes into the picture in 128, they're given all of the trees for food. I'm not the only one to notice this. I thank goodness that James B. Jordan did notice this. There's been a few other uh, Hebraists that have noticed if you follow uh, the, se the sequence of events, because Genesis at the end of chapter one, Eve is in the picture. But when God gives the commandment to Adam, Eve is not in the picture. And that's significant. It's significant because the serpent's going to play on this as to what God said. And God did not say what Eve said that he said. You have to be, what's the Hebrew teaching you here? When it comes to the word of God, be exact. Exactly what I said. I didn't say put that type of fire in the incense and I strike them dead because that's not what I said exactly. What's, what, what is the harm with a little bit of added incense? Well, because it's not exactly what I said. That's the striking nature of sin. Do you realize that we do sin when we don't do exactly what God says? Then that's a sin. Well, I'm condemned. I'm sure I did something from that point, getting up here to this point, that was not exactly what God in his conformity of character would measure. But this is a significant thing here. So the serpent uh, creature, Nakash, I'll call him, um, it's not a serpent, it's a behemoth, it's a creature, it's, uh, it's a living creature, which were made on day six. Uh, creepy crawling things were made earlier. They weren't made on day six. So this is a creature of sorts. It's an only type of creature. Uh, it doesn't have a female counterpart, and it eventually it dies. But there's this interesting thing about seed going on, and seed of the woman and your seed. And we know that uh, behemoth creatures, uh, living creatures, don't cohabit with Eve or women. So we know that going into the story. So there's a whole lot of mysterious things that you have to kind of wonder or ask the questions about as to what in the world is going on here. We find this exclamation with Eve when she has a child. Uh, she exclaims, I've had a man-child. Uh, Noah takes the place as he's the seed that's going to give us relief from comfort from the ground that God has cursed. You always have to read back, and I was fortunate to have uh, Dwayne Christensen as a teacher um, where he talks about the scriptures teach us to read forward and then back up, read back again, and then read forward, and then read back, and then read forward, and keep moving in that motion so that you have to go back to the original text, as we'll see here, when Satan comes to Eve, he says, has God now said that you, plural, not singular, you, plural, are not to eat from any of the trees? And she cuts him off. I, I, I would go with a lot of the Hebraists here that there's a cutoff point because there's kind of a dance that takes place. He leaves off with that you should not eat from any of the trees. And then she comes in and says, and finishes what has been stated in Genesis 1.28 and in Genesis 2.16. There's a conflation there of these two texts. 
She comes in and completes and says, we may eat of all of the trees and of all of the trees we do freely eat except for the tree that's in the midst of the garden that we may not eat lest we die. Now what follows is in the day you eat and notice where Satan comes in, oh, you shall not surely die, but in the day you will eat, your eyes will be opened. So the whole text and commandments, that's interesting in the Hebrew text because what it's doing is bringing together Genesis 128 by mentioning the word fruit, which is not mentioned in 216. It's only mentioned in 128. But then Eve brings in uh, aspects that's mentioned in Genesis 2.8 and in 2.16. And then Satan brings in in the day. He's the one that brings that one in. So everything's there. And what that's doing is this tying together these texts. Uh, goodbye, J-E-P-D. These texts are tied together literarily, and I think more sophisticated Hebraists are beginning to realize that there's, there's a lot of things going on here that, that are deliberate and tied rather than some drunken rabbi in the desert that saw some JEPD together and said, just slap them together, nobody will notice. <laughs> I don't, that, you know, that's a, I think a thoroughly debunked idea. Now, uh, so we have this conflation going on here, and the question centers around you will not die. Now, this aspect of death, spiritual death, and, and, and what death is meant here. From the text, and I'm a minimalist when it comes to text reading, I try to read as less as possible into the text as possible. As less as possible. And I don't see anything going on here about spiritual death or, or this, that, and the other. It's just death. And there's no idea of physical death. I don't like the phrase physical death. It's just death. The scriptures don't use physical death, spiritual death. It doesn't use those types of phrases. So when we say, you know, is that physical death or is that spirit? It's just death. So death here, if we understood what is meant in the ordinary sense, unless we're told something else, it's just death. It's, you'll, you'll die. When you eat, you'll die. That's the idea. Now, some people like to make uh, the idea that uh, dying, you will die, or there's an eventual kind of thing. But the same construction, an infinitive absolute followed by an imperfect, is of all the trees of the, fruit of, the of fruit, of all the fruit of the trees that are in the garden, you may eat. That's an infinitive absolute followed by an imperfect. But we don't say eating, you shall may eat. We, we don't translate it that way. We translate it, you shall certainly eat. That's what infinitive absolutes followed by imperfects do. It's just certainty. You will certainly die. I can go either way on the time, but the focus is when it says in the day you eat, that seems to put a focus or an emphasis more on kind of an immediacy kind of thing. And it's interesting that when Yahweh does show up, he shows up in the day. It's in Hayom, the day. So he's in the day. He shows up in the day that they've eaten. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's assume, because with, uh, if you follow the opening dialogue or opening book of, uh, uh, you know, like Karl Barth's uh, Church Dogmatics, uh, theology is a science. So here's our data. We look at it, we try to assimilate, and then we run an ideal through, like annihilationism, run it through all the text, which is our data, and see if it pans out, see if it works. Is it consistent? Can it go through? Can it uh, go through the problem text and all of the objections raised and this, that, and the other, and can it float as a consistent theory, and that's what we'll do here with this, and then tie it and see what it does with annihilationism, which I don't think is an issue of separation or fellowship or anything like that. Um, this issue here of death, let's just say that that's what's meant by it, what we would typically call physical death, that that's capital punishment. The, the Hebrew is phrased in such a way that in Leviticus we find capital crimes that are, if you commit adultery, you shall surely be put to death. This is the phrasing that we find. So let's assume that that's the case here. When Adam eats, he'll die. But it's when Adam eats. Doesn't say anything about Eve. Are you supposed to eat from all of the trees that are in the garden? No, we may eat of all the trees, but God said, lest uh, with the, the tree that's in the midst of the garden, we, plural, are not allowed to eat, and unless we eat, we will die, plural, all plural. The serpent turns this around and says, no, 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 you will not uh, surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil, which is true. I want to know where Satan got this information, because this idea about knowing uh, good and evil and your eyes being open and being like God knowing good and evil, that's not in any of the texts yet. Where did he get this information from? 
How did he know their eyes were going to be opened? How did he know anything about any of this? He must have heard it either from Adam or he heard God tell Adam in the text. These are things that we have to ask the questions of and then deduce from the text because the vocabulary that Satan is using, we'll call him Satan or the Nakash or whatever, and I'm not going to get into a whole biography on that uh, here for the sake of time. So I'll just use the word Satan. You can just bear with me. The vocabulary that he's using is also of the terms of what God has said. So he must have heard God say this to Adam. And then he's approaching the woman because God did not speak to Adam this commandment. So this sets up kind of a, a, good, a, a good situation. Now I mentioned reading forward and backward. Reading forward and backward. And there's interesting stories in the text, the vocabulary, the structures, the syntax, um, here from, and this is the, the Hebrew, so it's, you go to other stories and you start seeing a little similarities, like in chapter 20 of Genesis. And there in chapter 20 of Genesis, Abraham has this thing about making Sarah his sister. He does it a few times. And he comes to Abimelech there and he says, you know, tell him you're my sister. And Abimelech is prevented from doing this lest he should surely die or would be put to death. God says, you are a dead man. So, all of the vocabulary that we find is in this interesting little story about Abimelech. And what uh, Christensen and others are saying is that often the scriptures are commentaries on other scriptures. You'll find only one word or two words mentioned in Genesis, and then way over in Deuteronomy, you find just that one word again. And what that's telling you to do is go back to the one word where that occurs. Because God wants you reading the whole scriptures all of the time. So he's always tying it all together so that you read it all the time. And anyway, that's one theory of Christensen. Um, his two-part, two-volume Deuteronomy uh, word biblical commentary on Deuteronomy. If you don't have those, I highly recommend those two. He gets into this whole canonical reading um, approach that he takes. So, lest he be put to death. And, but God intervenes with Abimelech, gives him a dream. He doesn't sleep with the sister, right? Or sleep with uh, whom he thinks is Abraham's sister, but it's his wife. And it would have brought sin and judgment on the whole community. And God says, I've prevented you from sin and keeping you from being put to death. Okay, great. Why didn't he do that here in Genesis 3? See, that makes me, re that makes me go back and ask that question because the situation is kind of the same here. He's being tempted with something. Abimelech's being tempted with something, and he's, what, he's going to go into some forbidden fruit, so to speak, with Sarah. And God intervenes and says, hey, don't do that. I've prevented you from sin. Well, why didn't he do that here? He could have. If I read another story, I think that Job is a very large commentary. I'm one of these guys that believes that you should read Genesis first, then read Job. Job would follow naturally after Genesis in, in terms of its vocabulary. Um, but in Job, may it not be that Satan says, hey, or God says, have you considered all that I made in my creation and this, that, and the other? Have you considered Adam? Well, you've got a hedge of protection around Adam. I can't do anything with him. Well, very well. But I, I guarantee you, if I could get a hold of him, he'll curse you to your face. That's what he wants to do with all of us, by the way. Get us to curse God to his face. That's his job. And it's his job here. So, did God say, you shall not eat plural or singular? He said it's singular. Satan goes to the woman whom it was not spoken to, asks her, so what is it that's being said? Oh no, you, plural, shall not die. When you eat, you shall have your eyes open and you'll know good and evil like God. Before I get into the whole punchline here, there's another thing going on. Adam and Eve are perfectly innocent in this. The tree is good for food, that is, as, as it states at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, that the tree is pleasing to the eye and it's good for fruit. So when Eve sees that it's good for food, she's not lusting. Now I've read in commentaries where she's lusting. That's not lust. It's good for food. It's what, the, it's what the text says. Everything God makes is good. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is good. It's good because God made it. It's in the midst of the garden, and it's good. Everything he makes is good. All of the animals that he makes are good, including the one in Genesis chapter 3, the animal that he made, which was more craftier than all the other animals. Is there any indication here that this creature is evil? 
in the text? Fangs, claws, blood, drenching, drooling out of his mouth, frightening Eve into this conversation? No. It's an ordinary conversation with an intelligent being talking to another intelligent being. There's nothing scary or spooky here at all. He's asking a question in light of the fact that Adam was given a commandment not to eat, and now this Eve creature comes into the picture. A good prosecutor is going to come along. Does the situation now sit uh, now, now change? Are you both now uh, now? Uh, let me. Can I, can I get some clarity on this? Are you both now not allowed to eat from all of the trees, or how does this work now that you're in the picture? Circumstances have changed. Now we know in insurance, if you bring another human being into your insurance. That changes the policy. Everything changes. What's going on here? That, at least that's what he's asking. And she reverts back and says, no, we shall not eat. We shall not even touch it. Which, by the way, we shall not touch it. People like to harp on that as, oh, there's her sin. She's adding to the word of God. Uh, no, she's not. I think Calvin got this actually correct on this one. Uh, that's her piety, because if I'm not supposed to eat something, better not even touch it. I got to touch it before I eat it. Best not to touch it. Oh, that's just good stuff. I highly recommend that. If you're struggling with something, uh, cut your hand off it if it, if it offends you. You know, if you're, <laughs> then cut your hand off. That's what she's doing there. We could call them fences. Just best not even to go around certain places or certain things if it's going to be a pain or a bother or get something to, that uh, gets you to do something that you may not want or puts you in a situation of temptation. I suggest not going there. That's, this is piety here. This is innocence. Keep in mind, sin does not enter in until the transgression is broken. Prior to that, there's no sin. So how can evil and sin and death already be working in these two in leading some sort of rebellion? Yeah, I want to be like God. Yeah, how dare he impose a rule over us, giving us everything and all these guards and gives us all these trees and all this fruit and, and leaves us out with one tree. How He's an imposing his rule over, oh, I want to be God. Uh, is that going on here? I don't see it. John Piper says that's what's going on here. I think I can do it better than you, God. I don't, that's not in here. That's not in there at all. A groundwork is being laid here. Later we find, see, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta read forward. It doesn't answer it here, but when you get to the end of Genesis 3, and then you go back and read it again, it starts making sense. So innocently, Eve takes and she eats and nothing happens. Nothing. So this good creature that God made and placed in this good garden next to these good trees, next to my good husband that's right here, talking about wanting to know God and to experience good and evil before so that we can know what good and evil is, so that we can avoid the evil and do the good and please our maker. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing. Be imitators of God. Doesn't God want us to know what good and evil is? And the serpent is correct. He shall be, he, man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil. Yeah, correct. Uh, people on my view have always asked, well, you're making the Satan tell the truth. Well, you know, he occasionally knows how to. That's what he uses in deception. Uh, deception always has a, an appeal and a look of truth to it, or it wouldn't be deception. Deception operates when you don't know that you're being deceived. Now, that's powerful deception. When you're doing what you think is good, when it's actually evil, that's the best. Paul encountered that in Romans 7, which borrows a lot of this language. Paul's persecuting and having some put to death or at least appealing their death or, 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 appealing or, or wanting their death or dragging them out of their houses or doing whatever it is that he's doing. And he's doing so because it's blasphemous. This Jesus of Nazareth sect is blasphemous. And with blasphemy, according to Torah, you expose it, you persecute it, you imprison it, and if you can get away with it, stone it. Put it to death. That's what you do with blasphemy. I'm following the law of God. I'm doing what is good. Meanwhile, he's persecuting Jesus and God 
the God of Abraham himself, which he later finds out. The very good that he thinks that he's doing is actually evil. And he uses the word, and sin deceived me. Well, Eve's deceived. She says this. We'll get to the confession. But anyway, nothing happens. It's very significant. And then she gives to Adam, who's there with her. Um, and people make uh, issues. Was Adam there standing with? Yes, it's, it's, <laughs> it's what it says. He, he's there with her. He's witnessing the whole thing here. That comes out very clear in, in the end of Genesis 3. Gives to him, and he eats. And then their eyes are opened. Now, whether they know their eyes are open, we don't know. It just says, and their eyes are open. And they knew. Now, the noun is da'at, so knowing is yada. So, and they knew that's knowledge. That's knowledge. And they knew that they were naked. There's an interesting thing between being subtle and naked. Satan is subtle, arum. They are naked, aram. Very close words. They're just pointed differently. The, but the consonants are the same. That's another study. Um, their eyes are open, and they knew that they were naked. Now, the verse before this just before Satan enters into the scene and starts talking, it says, and they knew that they were naked and they knew no shame. Or they were both naked and they knew no shame. And now all of a sudden, we want to read into the text that all of a sudden, uh, Eve was embarrassed uh, of her private parts and Eve and Adam all of a sudden started doing, and that's not, the, that's not what it says. Read it. It's not what it says. I'm not embarrassed ever in front of my wife getting out of the shower or anything else, ever. I have no shame in front of my wife, ever. She has no shame in front of me. I have no shame in front of her. Uh, why all of a sudden would they develop shame? They have no shame. There's no shame. It doesn't say that, and they had shame because they were naked. It doesn't say that. Be careful what you read into the text. It doesn't say that. It says that they came up with a good idea of coming up with some aprons, and then they got some leaves, and they started to sew them together apparently unaware that anything has really transpired at all. We don't see anything. And that's the point, because the next verse then says, the kol Elohim, the voice of God. And I heard the voice of God. And we know, if you know your Bible, if you know your Old Testament, the voice of God, this becomes, this is a central theme. The voice of God. I heard the voice of God. What convicts of sin? If apart from the voice of God, what convicts of, skin, of sin? What convicts you of a sin? If God doesn't speak, would you be convicted? The Holy Spirit came for conviction of sin. Without God, there's no conviction of sin. Uh, just look in the world. They get away and they, they do whatever they fancy in their minds to do not perverted to them. There's no conviction. They relish in it. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, not only do they applaud it, they approve it. They clap their hands at it. The more evil, the more filthy, the better. It's great. This is great. Let's parade it in the streets. There's no conviction, but when the voice of God comes on the scene, there's conviction. And that's what's happening here. So prior to this, they eat, their eyes are open whether they know this or not or whatever, and then they come up with a good idea. Let's make some clothes. Okay, yeah, how's this, how's this look? Good? Eve? Good? Yeah. Now, is there anything evil about making clothes and tunics and garments? I can't find anywhere in Scripture where making clothes is condemned. What I'm doing here is uh, utilizing various techniques from various philosophy, various types of, of reading of hermeneutics and this, that, and the other, stripping away my tradition, stripping away these types of things and just trying to get at bare text. And then a few other commentators alongside, uh, a handful, not many, because the majority uh, read this through traditional lens, but I did manage to find a few. And stripping away all of this and seeing that here's a, here's a story that's going on that involves this idea and with annihilationism and other types of texts where we come in and we read with our, we read, then it's very easy. We know we do it. Thank God for postmodernism because they're pointing it out all over the place. But if you were a Christian apologist back in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, you would have already known this because they were writing, writing about this stuff way ahead of time. 
that's another topic. Um, but in this text, nothing's going on, and then God shows up, and it's, there's an interesting exchange, and he says, Adam, where are you? And Adam comes out of, he doesn't uh, run from God, he doesn't do anything, it's just like a response, he just hides, he hides, he said, I heard your voice, and I hid, because I was naked. Now, where's the evil in that? Has he done anything evil other than just eating of the tree? That's the only specific thing that we know of. Adam, where are you? He doesn't go in the opposite direction like Jonah. Adam comes out. This is God's son. And God loves his son just as much as he loves any of us in this room. This is his first son. Now, did you eat singular from the tree I told you singular not to eat from? The woman that you gave me, she gave to me, and I ate. That's a confession. Now, I don't know of pastors, but when you hear a confession, you hear a confession, and that's a confession. Of, that's a confession. That's, that's God coming on the scene and asking for accountability, responsibility. Where are you? What did you do? I ate. Now, one, people, now, one group of people wants to see this as, well, he's blaming Eve. I don't, I don't, he's, he's stating the fact, uh, the woman that you gave to him, did he not? It says that in the text. And she gave to him. Is that a fact? Did she give it to him? Okay, it's, that's a fact. Not a blame. The word key, uh, Hebrew for, for because or a causal kind of, uh, is not uh, because she gave to me and I ate. That's not there. These are the facts. The woman that you so graciously gave, she gave to me and I ate. And God says nothing. Holds off judgment. Because the judgment is in the day you eat of it, Adam, you will die. But hold that thought. What did you do? He moves right into the, uh, to begin to talk to Eve. And Eve says, well, if it wasn't for this sorry man that you gave me that was standing right there and could have said something about it, Adam, why didn't you say something about that? And she doesn't do any of that at all. Nothing. What she says is, I was deceived. Now, is that true or false? Paul says it's true because he uses the same word. She was deceived. Is it true? Now, the word deceived there, what does that mean? Tricked. I was sold something that I thought was good when in fact it turned out not, I, it shouldn't have been done. Um, I was hacked into and somebody downloaded something and I opened it up and it was a deal that said I've got $20,000 if I just do this and that and the other and I did it and the next thing I know my bank's clear. But it looked, I, I didn't deliberately do this. That's what deceived means. She's stating a fact. And then she says, without mentioning Adam whatsoever, not blaming him, not blaming the serpent, and I ate. Now, she could have lied and said, what? Well, oh, that. Uh, no, what are you talking about? I didn't, what, huh? Eat? No, I didn't eat anything. What do you, I, I eat it. None of this is going on. See, when you strip, when I stripped away this and I started coming at it, assuming uh, hypothetically this approach and then just started reading it through this approach, I began to wonder, wait a minute, so what's death here? Because they, here's the problem that we all recognize, they don't die the day that they ate. Why not? And the reason why they don't is because of mitigating circumstances, because he doesn't say anything to Eve. Instead, he goes directly to Satan, and he doesn't even question Satan. In fact, he lowers the boom on him, and he says, because you did this. Now, he, <laughs> that's a judge. What did you do? Well, I ate. The woman that you gave, okay. Did you do that? Yes, I did. I was deceived by the serpent, and, <laughs> and I ate. Because you did this. That's, you see that? 
He's going right to the source of the problem of evil because you did this. Cursed are you above all cat. Now, is he talking the way to his children this way? No. He's not talking to his children that way. But he is talking to this evil one over here. This changes the whole game. So they didn't spiritually die the day that they ate. They didn't physically die the day that they ate. They did become like God, knowing good and evil, and that has ramifications for epistemology that I am only beginning now to explore. But it's interesting when you read Shelley or whether you read uh, any of the romantic uh, philosophers in and of that time, they're all in this text. If you read Frankenstein, they're in this text. If you read Milton, he's in this text. If you read all Nietzsche, he's in this text. They are all Derrida, they're in this text. They're all in this text because there's things that are going on here about epistemology, about good, right, wrong, bad, correct, incorrect, and all of our dialectics that goes on in everything we do, say, smell, touch, taste, dress, wear. I might be looking good. I might not leave you looking good. It's according to your stand. And then there's this thing, well, it's according to your subjective reason. So it might look good. So let's try on these fig leaves. They may look good. They may not look good. I don't know. It depends on, and then all of this begins to increase. And now we've got a bunch of people running around deciding what life is on the basis of what's correct, incorrect, good, wrong, up, down, and that should be the same for you too because I have knowledge of good and evil, you know, like God. And if I could get just enough of you guys together, we could take that guy's land over there. You know, we need living space. Yeah, they're weaker. Okay, let's go over there. And, get, and then the next thing you know, you have all of these people with knowledge, and it seems to me that our problem is knowledge, and death, and the fact that we know our own mortality, if you read a lot of the philosophers, because that's what they are in angst about. Because if your epistemology is empirical, you don't know what's on the other side. And that's scary. And that leads us right into what is on the other side. Now, I don't think that spiritual death is going on here because then they say that Adam was separated from God. He, he became a cursed, a foul, just disgusting, separated, an enmity with God leading a rebellion. And again, none of this is going on in the text. Instead, God calls out to Adam and Adam answers. It looks like they're having a conversation to me. It looks like that there's a relationship going on there. And one's taking uh, the other and saying, okay, this is what's going to happen. There has to be consequences. And then I'm cutting you off from the tree of life. And there's no mistake that the tree of life is in Genesis and the tree of life is at the very end in, in Revelation. That's a, as Christensen would say, that's a canonical, that was purposely done, probably by the apostles in Rome. But that was purposely done. Now, what is it then that's our problem? Well, knowledge, what is it that we need to get back into believing or a relationship with God? Well, the knowledge of the Son of God. How do we get that? By the Holy Spirit or by conviction or however the Holy Spirit operates in this, that, and the other. That's how we do it. This idea of spiritual death, though, that we're, this, this, we're automatically born into this just depraved, disgusting, depraved, at, we hate God, we hate everything about God's state. Uh, that's in very rich in my tradition, I can't find uh, any justification for it in this text here. And then they say, well, what he was threatened with was second death or eternal separation from God. And if that's the case, then what Adam would have had to have had done is that he would have had to have died. No, he'd had to have first to have been regenerated by faith, then die, then raised again from the dead so that he could stand judgment and he'd be thrown into the lake of fire. All on that day would have to have, have had to happen. And then they say I'm being ridiculous. Well, what would have had to have had to happen? So you're, what you're saying is that God set it up in such a way that if Adam did this sin, this transgression that God forbid him to do, then that was it, lights out, no more, that's it, done. That's it. God provided no clause by which mitigating circumstances and set it up in just such a way where his righteousness prevails, he is righteous. Where the threat of death is looming and foreboding, but the mercy of God comes in and says, not today. 
I'll give you a chance. In fact, I'll give you faith. A seed will come and destroy and undo what it is that you've done here this day. So there's hope. Faith and hope. And in response to this, Adam doesn't say, oh God, I hate you so much for punishing. Instead, he, the very next response, and it's beautiful, the very next response is, and Adam named his wife life. Why? Because God gave me life. He could have killed me, and he gave me life instead. This is grace. This is the gospel of God. This is salvation by grace, not by works. It's salvation by grace. It's mercy. God's showing mercy of the court. Now, it's interesting. From one source that I read, Adam, uh, Alan Dershowitz, you know, Harvard lawyer and all this bunch of stuff, right? He's been there for like 40 years or whatever. And, but he's also Jewish, and he grew up Jewish, and he grew up reading Talmud and all this other stuff. So he wrote a commentary on Genesis. Probably a lot of you don't know that Alan Dershowitz wrote a commentary on Genesis, but he did. And he goes particularly in this text, and he approaches it as an expert lawyer. And that's exactly what he says is going on here. God issues a punishment. It's not good. The judge issues from the bench a stay. I could give it to you, maximum penalty, but not today. And I'll throw in an extra added bonus of hope. Um, play your cards right. You will return to the dust. God is just. You will live forever. There's resurrection. Everything's right here. It's all right there. Resurrection of the dead is there. Because how else is the promise to come good unless you're raised from the dead? But if man's life ends in the dust, all is lost. There has to be resurrection. Enter one Abraham who goes up to offer his son Isaac. Why does he so freely do this? Because God has promised through Isaac he would have a nation and kings and princes, right? Through Isaac. So if you're asking me to kill Isaac, yeah, I'll take him up to the mountain. You'll just raise him from the dead again. Because, that's, because you don't lie. If I kill Isaac and he remains dead and then he begins to rot, well, then you're a liar. It's interesting in the little word pronoun in Genesis where it says, we and my son are going to go up and worship on the mountain and we shall return. He knew he would return with Isaac. One way or the other, God would raise him from the dead or God would stop him from doing what it is that he told him to do. But Abraham was fully prepared to give his son Isaac because resurrection is already embedded in the text. It, and I think resurrection is embedded here. So what is death? Well, what is it that happens? And I'll finish. I need to be told. Yes, 11 of 6. When do I need to end? Or for questioning or whatever. What? I don't know what my... Okay. Um, oh, good. That's rare. Um... What is the New Testament filled with? Eternal life. Immortality. Immortality with God forever in the new heavens and a new earth. Immortality standing again in the land. Resurrect Anastasia standing again in the land. Standing again in the land. Standing in creation with the birds and the trees and the cosmos and the galaxies unexplored. Forever, for eternity. That's, the, that's Psalm 8. And to enjoy that forever, for immortality, Im immortal life. This is what Adam is separated from and cut off from. It's very clearly shown to you in the text. Now, I was told not to use the word clearly. <laughs> it's in the text there where Adam is, lest he live forever, he's banished from the Garden of Eden. But yet before then, he's clothed with two words there, a tunic that's used in Leviticus. And the hide of the tunic is only used for Levitical priests. They could take a hide or the skin of the hide and use that for their own purposes. And only the priests were allowed to do that. That fits nicely in with the whole Adam priest, uh, priestly theology, temple theology stuff. God clothes him and covers over, clothes him. So you know that blood is shed. Where, where, did, I, where did Abel ever get the idea of shedding blood to offer to God? Where did he, well, his dad taught him that. His dad taught him this is what happened in the garden. And God did this for us and clothed us instead. Of, and Adam, Abel, by faith, recognized, oh, right, you, you, we should have died. But God in his mercy has allowed us to live. 
I will give you the best of my flocks. I'll give you the best of everything that I have. That, that, see, I, Abel got it. He, he lived by faith, was regenerated and understood what was going on. Cain, on the other hand, kind of got it, but wanted to, according to his knowledge of good and evil, invent his own way of doing it. See what's going on there? They're both making sacrifices and religions and doing their own things, but one wants to do it his way and the other one's doing it the way that God has revealed for it to be done. One is merciful and is understanding the mercy that's involved in the sacrifice of offering a sacrifice as Abel does it. Death of an animal, not spiritual death, death, substitution, death. God forgives and gives me time and life. Sometimes, because Abel offers these substitutionary sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins and the enemies of God kill him. Abel dies before Adam does, and Adam's the one that was threatened with the penalty of death, and Abel beats him to it. Quite sad. If the death that is mentioned here that is stayed is the death that is to be destroyed when Jesus returns and swallows up the death, ha, moot, swallows up the death, in Isaiah 25, and that's the same one that's picked up in Romans and in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul quotes Isaiah 25 and talks about the covering, their canopy, uh, using the language of Genesis, that covers over all of the nations, which is hamut, which is death, and that will be swallowed up. And Paul pictures that as Christ swallowing up the death. And we see that all the way at the very end in Revelation, where an allusion is made to Isaiah 25 and the death. So you can go to Romans chapter 5 and realize with Adam that the death, hathanatos, that's the word that Paul's using, hathanatos, the article's there with that, like Hamut. Death enters into Adam through, so what death is he talking? Well, he's talking about the death that I'm currently going through and that you're all going through and that inevitably we will all be there one day and we know it. And so we get insurance and we plan around it and we have little being things on our cars that I can't stand that go dung, dung, dung. <laughs> My dad found a way to take that out so it wouldn't ring because we hated seatbelts. <laughs> that was my dad. Um, wear helmets. Why? Is your kids safe? You got insurance? You're 50 years old. Oh, did you get a colonoscopy? You know, when you're 50 years old, you got to get a colonoscopy. Wow, well, you don't want to die, do you? How much do we do during our day that's focused around avoiding death? It's pervasive. And then we want to be young. We don't want to grow old. We all want to look young, the fountain of youth and this mythology that comes with all of that kind of stuff. I don't want to get old. I actually embrace getting old because I know it's inevitable. It's part of God's plan, so I embrace it. I look forward to getting old. One, today I woke up, one, one day more older. Great. Now, I'd love to live to be 100 or over 100. That's my goal. It's, been, it's an obsession since I was a kid. I've always wanted to be as old as I possibly can be. But today's culture is, oh, no, I don't want to be old. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Oh, why would you want to live? You see the culture? You see where you're getting? The, what's wrong with getting old? But you, you, well, is, is there, is, are you heading towards death? I thought Jesus took death away from the cross. These are interesting subjects that I could get into, and I'm being just painfully brief with them and what you want to do with, it, with annihilationism because I think there may be some interesting ties there. If the death that he's talking about here is what we would call physical death or capital punishment, and that did not happen in the day that he ate, neither did spiritual death. Which Calvin says, spiritual death, let me quote him, spiritual death in Ephesians commentary, uh, if spiritual death, which is alienation from God. Okay, why not call it alienation from God then? Where's spiritual death? I can't find spiritual death anywhere until Augustine. And then I read a lot of uh, books on, uh, you know, whatever, and they all say the same thing. And then earlier than that, you do find it in Philo. And early on when he's talking about Genesis, he talks about this passage. Adam obviously didn't physically die, but the word of God can't lie since it says in the day that he eats, he will die. Therefore, he must have died in some sense. Now, you can reason that way, and that's fine. Or 
you could take and go and reason another way. Because when you introduce the idea of spiritual death, then you have to enter into the idea that Adam at that, pers- at that point in time became this accursed, evil, enmity with God, fist-shaking, atheistic, how far do you want him to go? But that's just not what's going on in the text. And so when you read about many other commentators, uh, is that they just don't know how to make sense of the text. And some of the more liberal uh, Hebraists read this and say this is why this is all slapped together because it doesn't make any sense. That, oh, that's because there's different things, there's different levels of stories going on here and they got slapped together. There is, it, take those out and then it begins to start, yeah, and re-edit and redact and do all of that. And then, No, I, I can't take that approach. The fact is, is that it makes sense that Adam is threatened with death the day that he ate due to mitigating circumstances. If Adam was leading a rebellion, God would have killed him right there on the spot, but he wasn't. His son, Adam, was... Oh, God condemns the only kind because comes up. Key, because, because you hearken Shema, listen to Shema. Uh, Adam, Shema, he hears the voice of God. Shema, because you hear... Uh, the the, uh, voice of your wife. Now, you have to ask, well, when did he hear the voice of his wife? Well, the only time that Eve speaks is when she's speaking and he's with her. So let's read what Eve said. And he's listening. And there's your causal. Because you listened to what your wife said. Well, what did she say? Well, what she said is, we will die if we eat. And you should have come in there and corrected and said, no, that's not correct. It just applies to me, honey. Just to me. You eat all you want. Knock yourself out. It is good for food, after all. God made it. But because Adam's there and he's hearkening and he listens, and if we eat, we will die. She eats, nothing happens. Oh, okay, yeah. It's a good creature that God made. Yeah, it's good. Hey, um, I have an idea. Let's make some aprons of these um, big palm leaves here, the big leaves. Don't, what do you think about that? Is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Well, we'd have to sew them together. Yes, we have to sew them together. Well, if we could just tighten real tight here and just do this kind of thing, put them on. What do you think? Yeah, I think it looks good. Did you hear that? That's what's going on. Everything up to this point is when God shows up and then God asks for the, where are you? He gives him a confession. He confesses and God goes easy. He doesn't kill him. Isn't that grace? It's grace. Mitigating circumstances. There's hope for mankind. God's not wanting to wipe out everything. That's why when you really get to the story of Noah and you see what's going on here, It says that their hearts and mind was on evil and knowledge was on evil. Where did that come from? Their minds, their thinking was on evil. Their mind, it's the knowledge. Their thinking is on evil. What is it to be like God? And I'll end here with, with, if you want questions and such, um, because I know that I'm probably stirring up a ton of them. Um, I think the condition here is that we can reason with knowledge on the most convincing of appearances, uh, whole chalkboards of equations that only a handful of, of physicists could know. And it's quite, who, what are you going to argue against that? I don't, I mean, I can't argue against Richard Feynman. He's got a whole chalkboard full of, there's no way. The appearance of it and the knowledge of it, and I don't need to refer to God or the Bible, at all. At all. Do you? And that's where our world, is. It's, we hear the word relative and, and, and irrelative, and the church is becoming irrelevant. You can read a whole Chilton's manual on a Ford Mustang, and there's not one reference to God in that. Not one. You can read an entire surgical manual and procedure on cardiology. Not one reference to the Bible or God or anything else. Nothing. I don't need it. I don't need your God to function and operate in this world. 
I can do it autonomously. And I am my own self-referent of what I think is good and what I think is evil. You know, like God. Because God operates in his knowledge according to what self-referentially he says is good and what he says is evil. Well, if I'm like him, I'm going to be doing the same thing. I am my own source of what I think according to what I see and what I desire and what I want and how I rationalize as to what's good and what's evil, what's wrong, what's right, what's bad, what's good, what's correct, what's incorrect, according to my self-resources. And I don't need your God. I don't need him to build a car. I don't need him to build an air conditioner. I don't need him to love my daughters. I don't need him to, I don't have to take my kids to church. Uh, my kids are fine, by the way. We've never stepped foot in church, and two of them are doctors, and one of them's working with, uh, you know, over here in some organization over here that's giving to the, you know, some, uh, you know, environment cause or whatever, just laying down her life or whatever, and she's never stepped foot. I've talked to people like this. Because we can. And that's the problem. But we're going to die with that kind of thinking. And that's a problem. Because <laughs> we're going to be judged. And how do you, how do you, bridge, how do you bridge that gap? And, and uh, the rage on campuses today is epistemology. It has been for the last 35 years. But epistemology is where it's at right now. Um, and and eh, eh, I'll stop there. Anyway, thank you. Yep, I'm done. 11.20. All right. I hope surely by now everybody knows the drill, at least in the room. Step up to the microphone. Uh, and again, I, uh, get, it's okay to get very close to it and speak directly into it for the sake of those watching online especially so they can hear They're all you lining clearly. up. And, uh, and we do have people lining up to ask questions. And again, you see that uh, rethinkinghellconference.com slash questions. Uh, they go straight to my phone, and I'll read those to, to Sam. All right, let's fire away. So, so as a conditionalist, I'm often frustrated with uh, how little attention uh, is paid to death in Genesis 3 as a consequence. Um, but uh, I guess my question for you is, because obviously most traditionalists focus on this sort of spiritual aspect of, of death, um, do you see spiritual consequences for sin, for, for that disobedience in Genesis 3, or is it just, the, just physical I, death? <laughs> I think the, the, I think the consequences by, you, by the time you, you get, like Lamech is an interesting thing going on here. Uh, God says uh, he'll avenge Adam seven times, and then Lamech hears this, you know, from his brother or cousin, distant cousin or whatever. He hears this and says, I'll do one even better, you know, seven times seven. You know, he, it's, and then by the time you get to Noah, the story of Noah is just, it's the knowledge of the mind that's going on is always on evil all the time continuously. Um, so, and I, I don't, I'm not a Platonist. I, I, I don't, I'm not a, one of the, I'm a, um, uh, human beings is uh, one person, two natures. So I'm not a dualist kind of, you know, where the spirit is defined as person. It's spirit, spirit body is, that's one person. Whether, so, um, uh, I always use, when we talk about spirit and stuff like that, so Abraham on one hand is dead, yet on the other hand he's alive. So there's just one Abraham, he's dead and he's alive, both, two natures. So I don't make these, uh, the, the idea of, of what is spiritual and not spiritual, because when you start asking people what spiritual is, it gets really bizarre. Try it, yeah. try it sometime. Well, I guess maybe another way of saying it, I mean, are, are there, is there a, a kind of a depravity or something that happens, some sort of a state change in the nature of humanity that happens. Autonomy. It just, I, I, God's irrelevant. I, I don't, I, I get, for, there, there's kind of a progressive, uh, I, I guess I brought Noah up because there's a progression from Genesis. I don't think Adam and Eve are in this state. I don't think Abel is in this state. Hmm. Cain, God's talking to him and he's talking back, so he's not an atheist. They're having a conversation. And then God says, all right, you're not going to die either. Uh, Alan Dershowitz is like, what kind of God is this? He doles out these punishments. He never, he never comes good on them. You know, what kind of judge is this? Eh, toss it. You know, we would say he's a lenient judge and would want to get rid of him because he's, he's a liberal judge. Um, <laughs> that's what's going on. It's like, kill, Cain just killed his brother. 
kill this guy. No, no one's going to hurt you. It's like the exact, but so there's a progression, but so that by the time you get to Noah, it's, I'm killing them all. All right, got it. Except Noah. God's a softy. Except Noah. But, yeah, okay. I can go on. But no. So following up on that question a little bit, I guess, as it relates to the progression, um, you know, scholars like Michael Heiser points out oh, that, yeah. that, you know, psychotumble Judaism really uh, finds the problems of evil in the world uh, dating back to Genesis 6 and the Watchers, uh, the Tower of Babel, and does not actually point it on Adam at all. And in fact, nowhere in the Old Testament are you really going to find a, a point back to Adam as the kind of inception of evil. Do you, do you hold to that? Or, I mean, is there any validity in that view? Or, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that, I guess? I, I, will I offend you if I say no? I don't like making people mad. No, That's what <laughs> It's a problem. Um, uh, no, I think what Heiser is, is doing is just uh, reviving an old uh, Greek mythology and stuff like that. I completely, no, uh -uh. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I, I very strongly side that reading in the text without going on, that the sons of God are, the son, is there, are sons of Adam and the daughters of Adam. It's daughters of ha Adam. It's, so when you see ha Adam, that's always referring back. I follow Christensen and others. That's always refer, it's, it's How many times do you have to repeat the creation story? To, you know, I don't I keep repeating it over and over. You know, you get it. So... It is referred to back. I think we've minimized a lot of that. I think a lot of scholars, like a, like a lot of early scholars were saying, oh, the Old Testament nowhere mentions resurrection of the dead. Hogwash, hogwash. It's all over the place. It's, it's, it's in the Psalms. It's embedded all over. It's like the story of Abraham. It's, it's everywhere. It's just, if you're not looking for it, you know, and I'm not using Popperian kind of thing there, uh, Karl Popper uh, falsification, but it, it's there. It, it, <laughs> It's like that, and I think that the, this new revival kind of going on with the watchers and all that kind of stuff. Number one, uh, angels can't mate with human beings. Seed like, seed like bearing seeds and all this kind of stuff. You know, it just goes against, and, and it makes us look a little bit nicer. You know, because after all, it wasn't us. It was these, uh, you know, giant, rough, you know, Nephilim, spooky creatures out there that got with some of our girls and made these even more uh, horrible mutants. It's their fault. It's, yeah, it's us. We're the problem. We're the problem for everything. <laughs> I am. I'm really short, so I have to tilt this down instead of up, by the way. Uh, Sam, great presentation. Uh, I have been saying for several years that... Um, Physical death is, which is a phrase we shouldn't have to use. It's just death, is, is what's going on in Genesis. Redundant physical death, saying that to me is redundant. Anymore. Exactly, right, I agree. Um, and I know how I have been answering the question I'm about to ask you, but I'd be curious to know how you answer it. What about texts that are very often cited in support of the concept of spiritual death, where Paul will say something like, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but now you've been made alive. Yeah. How do you, if death is just death, as you and I, I think, agree, how do you explain what Paul is saying there? And thank you for your answer. I would answer uh, along with Torrance and a few other, you know, just prolepsis, proleptic. Uh, uh, you, you, can, you can speak in such a way of a state. Um, if something doesn't change, then this is the state of it. But it's... I think, that, um, I think that Paul's encounter with the resurrected uh, human being, Jesus of Nazareth, colors every... He's, he speaks so often from the standpoint of consummation, which is why he loves Greek and the aorist tense, because that's a wonderful tense to be able to do all kinds of neat things with. Um, and he is speaking from this standpoint. We call it an already, not yet. I'm not particularly happy with that, uh, that phrase. Jesus is the already, we're the not yet if you want to use it that way. Um, but he speaks, he speaks from these standpoints um, of being, uh, 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 this is the way that it is and less. And so the two phrases that ring out quite a bit in the Old Testament is dead in sins. And then Paul brings out this dead to sins. If you're dead in sins, there's no hope for you. If you're dead to sins, Christ died to sin. 
and in Christ we die to sin. So therefore put to death, uh, you know, the uh, sin that is in your body, put to death so that you die to sin. Dying to sin is not the same as dying in sin. If, if you're one that is uh, pre-regenerate, you are dead in sin. That is taking into your whole state of being from beginning womb to tomb. But there's an interruption there with the Holy Spirit that alleviates that. But the sentence is dead in sin. But I don't think Paul ontologically is referring to us as in some sort of a spiritual... Because, I, again, I, I ask... You, you will ask them, what do you mean by that? And they'll say, well, alienated from God. But Paul uses that word there, alienated from God. So if that's the case, I've alienated people from my life before, but they weren't dead. They're just alienated. They're not participant in what it is that I've got going on here in my covenant. You're not in my covenant. You're not, you're, you're not going to benefit from anything I'm doing. You've been cut off from the inheritance. You're alienated. You're not dead. There might even be a stipulation you can get back in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also I hope that e helps. echo the sentiment <laughs> of getting rid of the... This, I don't find particularly useful distinctions between physical and spiritual death either. So I echo oh. that. But as listening to this, Good. curious because I could put myself in the position of a traditionalist or a conditionalist, grant your entire reading of that, and still see that my position is unscathed. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I've been accused of denying original sin and all the rest of it, and I'm a young earth guy, so I, you know, take what you want to do with that. I don't, um, I'm not an empiricist, so I'm, you know, the philosophers of science that are not Christians that I read are not interested in absolute truth anyway, because that's not the nature of, that, that would, <laughs> I don't want to get in, into that. Um, it, it stifles science. Science is adventurous. Science is always challenging. It, yeah. It's coming up with a new thing. It's, it's, that's, that's what makes it tick. Read, read Feynman. Um, so, uh, um, I don't, what was, what was the, uh, I got lost well, on I'm physics. Saying, is it fair to say that? Oh, does it change anything? Yeah, no, I've been accused of original, everything. denying original sin. So no, I don't think it affects anything because um, what happened to Adam, if, assuming they're the parents, of every human being that's ever existed, they're banished from the law or, or the tree of uh, life. So everyone dies. That's the natural consequences. I looked at it like you're in this eternal gas station here with the tree of life. Now that you're out of the gas station, eventually you just run out of gas. You have no access to the gas. So Adam just died. He's, he has no more gas. He's ran out. So at so, best... And that affects everybody because last I checked, everyone dies. Right, but the traditionalists even if they didn't hang their hat right there in that text, they could grant that reading as well, I think. They can. Yeah. If I understood you correctly, maybe over lunch at this... Oh, yeah, I could... Yeah, mine's not proving one way. Yeah, right, 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 right. Maybe further studies would. I don't, I don't know. Uh, given with your uh, uh, understanding with the tree of life being what, what feeds Adam and, and gives him uh, eternal life until he walks away from the garden, uh, what would you say about the New Testament? Would you tie that to sacramental efficacy with like the Eucharist? Would that be a tie to our uh, reception yeah. of eternal life through, through food? Yeah, I think there's something actual going on there. What it is, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, the Holy Spirit, God. Yeah, definitely. Um, in the same way, I think the uh, animal sacrifice was, uh, the life is in the blood. You shedding, uh, shedding uh, animal blood, that's serious stuff. I, I don't like killing animals. And that, you know, that's, we don't, in general, we don't like seeing dead animals and things like that. You know, we might hunt and this, that, and the other. But even that, we had to be granted permission. Um, and then take what you eat. Don't, yeah. In, in the law of Moses, there's, I mean, not even taking eggs from a mother while the mother's still, I mean, that's kind of sensitive. That's very sensitive there. Why would, just take the eggs. It's, come on, who cares? Well, he's sensitive. These are creatures. These are, these are living souls here. You don't just go around slaughtering animals. So 
because life is in the blood. So there's an efficacy that was at work through forgiveness of sins. God accepted this as a pleasing aroma, but it only worked up to effect. It couldn't raise the dead and bring immortality. Mm. Forgive sins. Couldn't raise the dead and bring immortality. Something else had to happen. This is why I think in Revelation, John's weeping because no one in heaven and on earth are, are worthy to open the, uh, the, the scrolls and he's weeping because the dead cannot be raised and the end cannot come. It's the God's purpose cannot be accomplished. He can't bring man into immortality, new heavens and new earth, which is what the end of the, of the revelation is. This cannot happen. Animal sacrifices are great, but they can't bring about what it is that I want to, oh, the line of the tri, one is slain, blood, his blood will take you to the other side. Uh, animal blood can only go so far. You know, so hopefully that It did. Helps. It touched yeah. on it a bit. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sorry for hogging the microphone, everybody, uh, by asking a second question. But to follow up to Jonathan Pritchett's question, can't a traditionalist affirm the conclusions you have? Here's why, as a, as a conditionalist, I want to know... Can a traditionalist, in fact, do that? And here's why. Uh, according to the traditional view of hell, it's not dead people who are in hell. Um, we believe in a resurrection. As a former hyperpreterist, you believe in, I'm sure, a resurrection of both the saved and the lost. So the, re the lost are going to be raised back to life, and we don't have to use spiritual or physical qualifiers. Right, we right. just say raised back to life. Well, then the traditionalist says they're going to remain that way for all eternity in hell, Whereas we annihilationists say, no, they're going to literally die a second time yeah. after being raised to judgment. So my question for you is, and especially in light of the fact that the Bible uses the language of death to describe what happens in hell, if you've come to the conclusion that death is just death and it's not code language for like spiritual death, how, do you, how could you maintain belief that the resurrected lost will never die? Kicking and screaming. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> I'm looking into that, but it's very attractive to me where, uh, you know, the, that lake of fire would be something that would just, um, but that's not something I'm, I've gone into yet. So it's, it's, I'm open to that. If, if, if that's what this is saying, and, and as Eli was saying, there's very, I've, I grew up with a Seventh-day Adventist uh, stepfather. May he uh, rest in peace. He's a wonder, wonderful man. I miss him, miss him, miss him every day. Um, but, and he went to seminary, so I heard a lot of the Seventh-day Adventists, and they have wonderful, tremendous stuff. If you've not read Seventh-day Adventism on this kind of material, uh, I, well, fudge. <laughs> so, yeah. But, well, and, but there's other, and uh, Seventh-day Adventism is at the Evangelical Theological Society. They're, even, they're considered evangelical. Um, I, can, you know, I grew up with a wonderful, God-fearing, wonderful, uh, Bible-believing man, um, you know, get rid of the LNG white stuff, but what, you know, whatever. We all have our thorns, so. All right, well, you, uh, you briefly referred to the story of Cain and Abel, and uh, we get a good question online that says, as you read the text of Genesis 4, aren't we reading, quote, shed blood for sacrifice, unquote, into the text? Wasn't <clears throat> God's rejection of Cain's sacrifice do more to his bad attitude? No. Nah. Well, there you go. <laughs> Well, because it's, it, it, he says, uh, if you do not do tov, if you do not do good, which, which is in comparison to Adam or Abel, who's doing, who's doing good. And the connections between the first fruits of the, the fatlings, that's Levitical. And the skin and the hide, just a few verses down. So skin, hide, fat, it's, it's, it's Genesis of what eventually does become Leviticus. So if you're an Israelite reading in the desert and Moses is right, and I believe Moses, so uh, Moses is writing this out in your uh, generation or two and you're reading this story uh, early on in Genesis and you've got Shabbat, you've got sacrifices, you've got hide, you've got an offering here, first fruits of the fatlings, and then you're seeing God from the mountain thunder, a Levitical, and I'm reading that, that my mind is immediately going to go, oh yeah, Genesis, it's a no-brainer, that's it's so, you know, original audience relevance. But they, an Israelite would have read that story of Cain and Abel and have understood there's right sacrifices uh, and there's wrong sacrifices. And you get punished sometimes for these wrong sacrifices. Even a little splash of little incense, you know, can, uh, God can react very quickly. Um, why, does he, why doesn't he do that all the time? Let's us know the nature of grace. He could. 
He could. We walk by grace. Well, you think you're good or something? <laughs> I always say that to my uh, people that go around because it has ramifications for regeneration too. Uh, this is a consummated thing. Eternal life, receiving eternal life is, is glorification, immortality, resurrection of the dead. That's when I receive eternal life and I live forever. Right now, I'm just in kind of an interim state. Um, have faith until, you, until the end of your life. Some people start out here and are great and they go to church and get baptized. They just don't make it unto the end of their life with faith. And I want my last gasp of breath to be Jesus is Lord. You know, you know. Anyway, I can, That's I'm That's a great way to finish right there. I want my last breath to be Jesus is Lord. Okay, and that is, we don't have any other good. online questions for you. <laughs> good. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> thanks, Sam, everybody. Yep. All right, good. Thank you.